Kia ora, I'm Tom Kitchen, and today on The Detail. The Alpine Fault is the South Island's largest natural hazard, spanning 850 kilometres from offshore Fiordland up the base of the Southern Alps through Marlborough and offshore Cook Strait. A big quake on the Alpine Fault is overdue. The risk of a major earthquake on the Alpine Fault has risen significantly. Scientists now say there's a 75% chance of eruption in the next 47 years. In the past, they'd put the likelihood at just 30%. That next quake could be bigger than magnitude 8. The last time there was a shake that big in New Zealand was in 1855. The West Coast will bear the brunt of a major quake. We'll be on our own for a week, two weeks, maybe even longer. This thing's coming. But just how bad will it be? Scientists are using innovative new techniques to help find the answers. We are using a laser system attached to optical fibres installed by Corus for telecommunications purposes. And how can we use that knowledge to better prepare at-risk communities? You use that science, factual-based approach. You know, you don't sugarcoat it, but you also don't seek to scare people. That is something that causes us legitimate concern, but on the other hand, we can prepare for that, and this is the time, really. Professor John Townend is a geophysicist at Victoria University. I study the science of earthquakes and uh, a lot of other processes to do with New Zealand's position uh, on top of a plate boundary. The sort of key focus of my research is to understand how the earth is deforming and what that means for future large earthquakes. And one of the things you've been looking at in quite a bit of detail is the Alpine Fault. That's right. The Alpine Fault is sort of the big elephant in the room for New Zealand at the moment because we have a very good geological record of past earthquakes. It goes back something like 8,000 years. And in that time, we've had a number of perhaps 25 or, or even more large earthquakes that have deformed the landscape and which geologists and paleoseismologists can see preserved after many thousands of years. So on that basis, we understand the fault to produce big earthquakes quite frequently. It produces them something like every 260 to 300 years. And we also know the timing of the last big earthquake, which was in 1717 AD. Those two pieces of information mean that we are quite late in the typical cycle of the Alpine Fault's big earthquakes. It doesn't mean an earthquake is imminent tomorrow or next week, but it does mean that compared to the long-term behaviour of the fault, we are now in a, in a fairly late stage. So how late are we? How overdue are we looking? Well, if you take 1717 AD and you and just sort of calculate how many years have gone by since then, we've had something like 306 years. And if different sections of the fault were to join up and rupture in one really big earthquake, then there's something like an 82% chance of that being a magnitude 8 earthquake in the next 50 years. And that would be bigger uh, by a small amount than anything we've seen in the last few years, including Kaikoura and the Dusky Sound earthquake in uh, 2009. <laughs> you put it like that, it sounds really scary. Well, we do know that the fault produces big earthquakes, and uh, that is something that causes you know causes us legitimate concern. But on the other hand, we can prepare for that, and this is the time really for communities and scientists uh, and engineers to be thinking ahead, thinking about what it might mean if the earthquake were to unfold the way we think it might. So, how are they thinking ahead? Professor Townend is leading several key research projects. One of them is called Salsa. SALSA stands for Southern Alps Long Skinny Array, and we've called it that because we have put out an array of seismometers that is very long, it's about 450 kilometres long, and it's quite skinny. Each of the instruments is sort of placed within about two or three kilometres of the Alpine Fault. And so if you look at it on a map, if you look at a, a space um, or a satellite image of the South Island, you can see the Alpine Fault very clearly in the landscape, and the SALSA network is basically mirroring that long straight line. And we're using that to record... Uh, two types of signal. One of them is very small earthquakes and other characteristics of the fault uh, that we can really only get at when we have such a big array that's recording continuously for you know, a couple of years or so. And the other thing we're recording is actually the background noise, uh, the background hum of the earth. And using that um, that background hum, we're actually able to extract very valuable information that tells us how slip on any one point on the fault might cause shaking at points throughout the South Island. By looking at this noise and analysing it in certain ways, we're able to extract very important information about how the next big earthquake might cause shaking in the entire South Island, or even the southern North Island. So how far are you along with this? Well, we put the instruments out, most of them, the seismometers, in November 2021. They've been out for about 18 months now, and 
During that time, we've gone down, we've visited each seismometer uh, about every six months to download data, to check on the battery levels, to repair any, any damage to the site. And we're now in the process of planning to remove the instruments in about six months' time. So we've collected the data that we really wanted to, but we're leaving things running another six months or so just to take advantage of having all those seismometers out at once. It's something like you know, getting on for 60 different sensors, each spaced about 10 kilometers apart, over that very long distance of 450 kilometers. It, it extends all the way from Maruya, Springs Junction, all the way down to Milford Sound. It's quite a big logistical effort to, to visit all those sites, and it was a huge effort to put all the instruments in. But now that they're running, and now that we have most of the data we, we intended to collect, we're really in the thick of the analysis phase. So what are you finding out? What's the data telling you? Well, having a network that is so so long and, and so um, so sort of regularly spaced enables us to record very small earthquakes along its length. And so part of the work that's being done at the moment, that work is really focusing on detecting very, very small earthquakes, much smaller than you might feel on average, but very valuable in terms of understanding what the sort of the roots of the Alpine Fault are doing right now. The fault is, is currently locked up tight. It's not slipping at the surface at least, but during this this sort of late period of the earthquake cycle, it's it's being stressed, it's being loaded, and at some point those stresses will, will be bigger than the fault can withstand, and it will slip, and that's an earthquake. But in the meantime, we can use the very, very small earthquakes as sort of um, sensors buried deep in the earth to understand how the fault is is deforming. There's another fun acronym that you have uh, for another research project you're working on at the moment, Sizzle. Sizzle is sort of an opportunistic study we're doing at the same time as Salsa is out. And Sizzle stands for South Island Seismology at the Speed of Light Experiment. And the reason we've called it that is because we are using... Um, a laser system attached to optical fibres installed by Corus for telecommunications purposes. Um, we're using that system to record seismic waves. Theory is if the ground shakes, the cable shakes too. Sensors every four metres record any movement. One month in and already 801 quakes. This is a really sort of rapidly evolving area of, of seismology in which we can take the communications infrastructure and by attaching the right sort of laser we can turn a 30 kilometer stretch of optical fiber into roughly seven and a half thousand different seismic sensors each spaced about four meters apart we are recording signals that are traveling through the fault zone uh, from earthquakes happening nearby or even earthquakes happening very far away we um, have recorded earthquakes over the last couple of months happening in the Kermadex and uh, south new zealand towards um, Macquarie Island and so on. And we can use all those different signals, again, as probes of the internal structure of the fault zone. We really want to understand what is the internal geometry, what is the, the structure of the fault, is it kinked, is it bent, uh, does it have multiple different strands to it. And the reason we want to know that is because those sorts of things will affect the way that uh, an earthquake rupture will, will eventuate. When an earthquake is, is started, it nucleates and begins to propagate along the fault, the internal structure of the fault and the way it inter interacts with the, the landscape will control the way the rupture develops. There's a bit of a puzzle, I guess, between salsa and sizzle. So putting them together, what is this going to tell us about what's going to happen when the big one hits? Well, that really gets to the heart of the matter. We, we know the Alpine Fault produces big earthquakes, but we haven't seen one ourselves in, in recorded memory. And so we don't really know what it will be like. Will it start in the south and rupture to the north? Will it start in the north and rupture south? Uh, will it go very deep? Will it rupture very slowly or very quickly? And these two experiments are really intended to address those questions. Using the data we're collecting with Salsa, we are we are building up a, a sort of a, a catalogue of many, many, many thousands of different rupture scenarios. And for each one of those, we can we can look at what the ramifications would be for different parts of the South Island or, or Southern North Island, different pieces of infrastructure. Um, wherever we have... Um, areas of concern, we can look at how each one of those scenarios might affect ground shaking there. And that's really important as we prepare for an event that we think is coming, but which we've not yet experienced. And it really, it sort of gets to the heart of the problem of dealing with big earthquakes. They happen infrequently, so you don't have too many previous experiences of, of dealing with, in this case, an Alpine Fault earthquake. Um, and yet you have to make decisions about community preparedness and about infrastructure development, and that sort of thing. 
the Alpine Fault is uh, is something that has always been there, so it's not a new risk, if you like. Um, it's why the South Island looks the way it does, with the very magnificent Southern Alps. This is Jamie Klein, Mayor of the Buller District, one of the areas that could end up completely cut off in a major earthquake on the Alpine Fault, AF8, as you'll hear Jamie call it. This is an area that's no stranger to disaster. Westport was hit by significant flooding three times in two years. And throw in the ever-present danger of the Alpine Fault. That risk has always been in the background. I think what's uh, changed is we now know a lot more about it. How does that translate to preparing for the big quake in your community? The challenge with something like AF8 is you don't get any warning. So the beauty of floods, you know, you get some weather warning, you know, usually a few days lead up um, and a little bit of time as the events unfold. With AF8, you know, we can be sitting here now and AF8 could happen in the next um, next minute or so. And so you really are needing to look at that in the context of where are you at any given time, what would be your sort of pre-prepared plans for your family um, or your business and all of those kinds of things. So in terms of preparedness, um, you know, the reality is Alpine Fault 8 magnitude will be a South Island-wide event. Um, and so districts like mine have, have traditionally relied a lot on external resource being able to come in to assist us in emergency um, response. So a s- emergency management um, resource from Canterbury and other other districts uh, coming in to help us. In AF8, that's unlikely to be the case because everyone will be in a, in a similar boat in one way or another. So AF8 preparedness is hugely focused on coordinating resources locally and making sure people are educated around what they can do for themselves and understanding and making sure they understand that um, for the first, um, you know, at least a week most likely, um, you know, the district will be on our own and we'll be dealing with the resources that we have available. Okay, so what kind of resources will you have available? Uh, Yes, so there's a lot of work going into understanding um, already been done around communications. So every, every emergency disaster event around New Zealand, you know, the the national the emergency management community is quite tight and they debrief and learn from and understand um, where the gaps were and try and improve better for the next event. You know, it was quite clear in Cyclone Gabriel, for instance, uh, uh, issues around communication. That's something the West Coast had thought about um, oh, more than a year ago. Um, and so we've, uh, West Coast Emergency Management have deployed um, Starlink uh, devices um, right, right throughout our district to certainly all our emergency operations centres, but also various Marae and community um, centres and things around the district. So that's a satellite communication system. They've also beefed up the uh, UHF radio, so the old sort of older school you know radios like uh, like the the police and things used to use making sure those networks are still available and they're looking at HF which is a um, probably again an older technology but again able to communicate um, like beyond the region so able to communicate to the world if you needed to. So um, so that, that sort of work is underway in terms of communication. A lot of work going into um, as well into generators so there's actually some mobile uh, electricity generators on uh, trailerized ones that are available for deployment around the region in each district. And um, and fuel supply as well. So there's a wee, there's a wee cache of airliftable fuel pods that can be distributed when needed uh, to c- make sure generators and things can be kept fueled up. Outside of that, there's a lot of work going on in um, in training. So there's a number of people. I think 100 150 people now on the west coast have um, done at least some level of sims training, um, and that uh, critical incident management training. And they they sit within our councils, within our major employers and community. So those are the sort of people that you know empowers them to to take a leadership role in emergency response. Yeah, I understand there's also a container set up kind of in South Westland as well, with kind of everything you might need in an emergency or say a big quake. I think there's a couple down there, and the community had input into um, into what they wanted in that or what they felt was important for their area that it service, serviced. Um, so there's a there's a plan to um, deploy further containers like that around um, the whole west coast um, and that'll just have a cache of, of some useful equipment and um, you know some first aid stuff and things like that um, maybe some small generators so one, one of the challenges on the west coast is relatively low population but a large geographic area and and a very active obviously um, natural environment so um, it's expensive to equip um, every inch of the district with everything that you would like to have so it's about um, about trying to figure out what is the best thing to have in, in each area and and um, and you know informing the community and training them up on how to use it yeah well as, as you say huge geographical base not many people and there is the challenge of having to try and pay for it 
So how can you pay for it? Yeah, so emergency management is rated um, coastwide by the West Coast Regional Council. Um, so, so they they fund it. It is a um, you know by a general rate over everybody. So that is a challenge to fund everything we need. Um, we do have good relationships with national with NEMA, National Emergency Management Agency, and the minister. Um, he understands the geographic remoteness and challenges we have down on the west coast and so um you know they have funded some additional resource at times and um and they have contestable funding for specific projects um which we always make sure we participate in just to start closing up some of those gaps it's not just this quake you're preparing for there's also more floods that could potentially be on the way it's just a bit more risk so is it affordable it's not going to be affordable on on our own, that's for sure. Um, and you know there are some big challenges for uh, New Zealand Inc, if you like, in terms of um, adapting and, and handling the effects of climate change, um, so frequency and intensity of events. Um, AF8 is, is slightly you know is kind of in, a, in another league um, compared to a more of a localized flooding event. So in Buller, when we had our floods, we had um, resource from across the South Island, and as the weeks progressed, we had resource from from a number of councils all over New Zealand. Um, that were coming in to help run the emergency operations centre and the military and things like that. In AF8, um, that's unlikely. It won't all be about Buller. It'll be about um, about South Island wide, and so that that's why it is quite a different beast to deal with. Um, in terms of affordability, I mean, yeah, I mean it's 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 the constant um, issue we have on the west coast is, is is affordability, even around the the science. So you know, we tend to try and take the focus of um, partnering with you know with the likes of GNS and and, and others, um, Ministry for the Environment, to try and sort of do like pilot schemes and things, so that they um they bring something to the table to help get some of that science done for us. You know, inundation modelling and liquefaction modelling, all those kinds of things, um, you know, we benefit from and so does the science community as well. So we look for those partnerships where we can to help ease the cost. Does this kind of thing keep you awake at night? Uh, yeah, absolutely it does. Um, because the difficult, some of this stuff hasn't been done before um, and it is it is difficult. You know, you have, this week I've had people in my office, um, you know, in tears, upset, um, blaming council, blaming me for effects on their properties, and um, you know, and it's it, because they're they're frustrated, they're uncertain about their future. Should they invest in their house? Should they do it up? All of that sort of thing, um, you know. And I don't have a clear pathway to offer people at the moment. Um, we know that that's coming. There's some legislation coming, and and in, um, in terms of the uh, climate adaptation bill, um, and I certainly hope that there is uh, a cross party. Um, support for whatever that looks like Um, because New Zealand deserves to have a solid and intergenerational approach to this these issues and and I think um, you know we can't afford to have this being at the whim of of um, a particular political party so um, yeah so I guess help is on the way in in that legislation and that will hopefully give people like me or people in my position the tools to be able to have a meaningful conversation with the community about what they can um, look forward to in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about this flooding and the constant <laughs> the constant flooding almost and preparing for more flooding. You've also got to adapt to climate change, don't you? Uh, the big quake's another thing for people to think about, I guess. Is this just leading to disaster fatigue, people just getting sick of disasters? I guess it's the approach you take, right? I mean, it's the reality, and so science is getting better and better, and so it's the approach we took through the floods is we... And certainly in my communication to the community right through the emergency is trying to share what we're hearing. Um, So we're not sitting around in a room making this stuff up. There's a whole raft of expertise. There's the NIWAs and MET services of the world, for instance, in that example, who are providing science and advice uh, as to what they're seeing happening, modelling, river modelling, all that sort of thing is all factoring into decision making around emergency management. And so we, we did a lot of work. Um, trying to share what well this is what we're hearing this is what we're basing our decisions on and this is why we're asking you know some people to move for instance so I think AF8 is a little bit a little bit similar a community you know you use that science factual based approach you know you don't sugarcoat it but you also don't seek to scare people it's not you know there's a certain reality of of you know that is how you live that's kind of one of the beautiful things about New Zealand um, but you know it's about understanding what that risk is and just just people stopping and pausing, just having a wee think about, you know, where do we go? Um, where is that friend that's got a house on higher ground? Or, you know, do we just have an extra few cans of food in the in the cupboard? Those kinds of things. It's just stop and pause and think, and based on science. Do you feel as though people need to prepare for this quake 
like it could happen in the next 10 minutes or like it could happen tomorrow? Do we need to be that prepared for it? Um, I mean, the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, it is overdue. Um, so, you know, everything you do today to prepare is, is something you won't regret if a fate help it happens tomorrow, you know. So that's really the only way to put it. I mean, you know, someone asked me the other day, are we ready for AF8 as a council or as a region? And my answer was, well, no, but we're an awful lot better prepared than we were 12 months ago and probably, you know, <laughs> triple more prepared than we were three or four years ago. So, you know, it's about um, it's about incremental improvement and just, um, just factoring it in. Don't let it dominate your life, but, you know, factor it in. It's a thing. And so is, but so is, um, you know, so is flooding, so is um, driving in your car to work each day. But I mean, you just need to be prepared. That's it for today. I'm Tom Kitchen. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by William Saunders. Our producers are Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison. Thanks to John Townend and Jamie Klein. Ka kite anō.